to our last talk that apparently our speaker doesn't even want to be here for. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Um, so uh, Jacob Cochran is going to talk to us about eDNA metabarcoding, which I'm personally very interested in, uh, using this detection tool across the Great Lakes. I apologize about that. There was a good talk going on next door. Um, and actually, um, this morning's talk, uh, Dr. Farrell, the plenary uh, session, provided some excellent background, actually, uh, regarding the St. Lawrence River and some invasive species situations on that river. Uh, to kind of lay some groundwork, so it was pretty timely uh, for him to share that prior, prior to this. Um, and so, the, uh, the invasion front that I'm going to be talking about is Tinch on the uh, St. Lawrence River. And so to give a brief history, um, this is a uh, Saprinid uh, native to Europe and Western Asia. In uh, 1986, there was an unlicensed fish farm in Quebec uh, that had fish illegally. Uh, and those fish uh, soon got into the Richelieu River and from there uh, moved throughout the, uh, the system. I'm going to use uh, this map here to kind of just give a quick rundown of the spread of those fish since 1986. Uh, and so the map here shows uh, Lake Ontario to the west, Champlain to the southeast. Uh, we have the St. Lawrence River, the Ottawa, Richelieu. And then we also have two uh, locking dams uh, along the system uh, as well. And so um, that 1986 uh, illegal fish farm in Quebec event kind of started as the origin. Uh, fish moved both down in Champlain and also were first detected uh, in the main stem St. Lawrence River in 2006. From 2009 to 2014, uh, they continued to move throughout the system upstream on the main stem of the St. Lawrence River uh, and really started to establish in the Montreal, Quebec area, uh, Lake St. Louis and then uh, uh, Lake Champlain as well. Uh, and since, and from those populations near Montreal, they've kind of moved up the Ottawa River into Lake St. Francis to where we are currently, where the present day invasion front is um, below um, the Moses Saunders Power Project, the Wadi Bandera Canal. Um, and that has uh, launched into some interest um, of Canadian, um, US, and tribal partners in this area of the river uh, through a tinch working group, uh, where the last few years we've been getting together and sharing ideas, information, and really just uh, contributing to monitoring uh, the spread of tinch up uh, the St. Lawrence River. But it is currently uh, just below the Lock and Dam, uh, right there near Cornwall, Ontario, we see in New York. Uh, so that's where our early detection and monitoring program comes in. That's what I'm I'm a part of with our aquatic invasive species program. Uh, we tend to focus on novel AIS um, in high priority locations across the Lower Great Lakes, um, but we also play a role in range expansions. And so um, when some of the some of the first tinge detections um, near Messina, New York occurred, it kind of uh, drew the attention of our program. And so in 2018, we began to, uh, we began to collect some surveys and start monitoring uh, both below um, the canal and above the canal uh, to help out with the, the, interest, the questions that the Tinch Working Group had uh, regarding the species. And since then, there's been a handful of fish captured, and that's what this map here on the right is. It's a, uh, NAS, it's the NAS ma map of uh, Tinch. And so as you can see, there's been a handful of fish captured uh, over the last few years, one of which our crew captured um, two years ago, uh, just below Long Sioux Dam. <clears throat> and so since 2018, we've been conducting a good amount of surveys in this section of the river, right at the invasion front, both uh, below the canal and also um, above the canal in uh, Lake St. Lawrence. Uh, in total, we've conducted 286 traditional surveys, uh, which has been primarily electrofishing uh, with some fike netting as well. Um, and this has all been occurring in um, littoral areas, backwater. We're targeting tinge areas because we're, we're actively trying to capture tinge. And so that's where our surveys are occurring. Um, in 2002 or 2003, we started to incorporate uh, eDNA and specifically eDNA metal barcoding to see if it could help us um, you know, spa cover spatially cover some more ground um, in the search for detecting tinge, uh, particularly in Lake St. Francis, which is where the big questions are right now. And so on the left is a photo uh, of us collecting a uh, water filtration sample with a Smith Root backpack, uh, actually at Wilson Hill WMA, which is a wetland, which would be difficult to get a boat in. So kind of nice to use boat and shore-based sampling, and again, in tinchy areas. But in total, 130 EMA samples uh, have been uh, collected. 
And so we kind of got to our first question is, uh, can we detect eDNA meta or attempt with eDNA meta barcoding? Is it a valid detection tool? Um, that was one of our big questions in 20, uh, 2022. And so a quick rundown, just an infographic here to show the field and lab process for this broad spectrum of fish surveillance application of eDNA meta barcoding. Um, we have the field component, uh, which is, uh, as I, the previous slide showed, a photo of just pretty simply collecting a uh, filter, uh, sampling water, and then uh, we have some pretty nifty self-desiccating filter packs that are quite convenient for us out in the field to preserve the sample, and then uh, our great geneticists with the Northeast Fishery Center uh, extract and amplify the DNA, uh, run it through their bioinformatics pipeline, assign taxonomic classifications, and from there, this is where there's kind of a divergence an eDNA with qPCR and then metabarcoding. Um, with qPCR, you know, using a marker, highly specific, yes or no of that species, metabarcoding, broad spectrum, a reference library tailored to the Great Lakes that provides not only, in this case, an AIS or a species of interest, which is tench, we also get a lot of native and non-native fish community data back from that same sample, which is pretty interesting, and I'll dive into um, in a few slides. So just kind of tackling, does eDNA meta barcoding detect tension in a way that seems reasonable to use it um, on the invasion front? Uh, what we have here is a map of our sampling effort in 2022 and 2023, um, just showing our traditional effort along with our uh, eDNA effort as well. Um, and as you can see here, you know, this is a large stretch of river that we're trying to cover. That's 40 river miles uh, that we're stretching it out. As you can see, we're using eDNA, the blue dots here to expand our coverage even further upstream while also uh, focusing um, our traditional efforts um, further upstream but around the Lock and Dam area. And so um, as you can see, any help we can get to look in this very large river um, is certainly appreciative. And what we found, uh, at least as far as tinge detections go with eDNA, is um, we, we did seem to get some uh, useful and uh, pretty realistic detections of tents using EDM and a barcoding. So the orange dot here is uh, where we can actually capture that fish. Um, and there's a few more fish that have been captured down there, like that NES map showed. Uh, St. Regis, one of their field crews, caught a tench a few years prior. And I also believe a commercial fisherman, St. Regis Waters, also caught a tench um, prior to that. Um, and so there's a few fish below the lock and dam here. And what this, that's what the vertical lines here are showing on the lock. So this is the Wiley Dondero Canal here at the bottom. And um, you have the Moses Saunders Dam to the north and then the Long Sioux Dam um, in, um, in the South Channel. Um, and so what we, what we saw looking at the DNA data was that we did get a few detections um, below the Wiley Dondero Canal, those are the blue dots. Um, and that makes sense because there's a few fish in that area, right? They're quite, quite rare currently in that area. And so out of 130 filters, three detections in areas, we, we would hope to get them, but no, we probably won't get a lot of detections that, that lined up with what we kind of thought. Interestingly enough, these two dots here are actually inside the Wiley Dondero Canal. Um, uh, so, which suggested that uh, the fish might be using the, the locks to uh, go from pool to pool, which um, is how they've gotten to where they are in Lake St. Francis. Um, so that was interesting. We sample inside the lock and dam. Uh, we've not actually caught a fish inside the lock and dam or above the lock and dam uh, in Lake St. Lawrence. So we can feel pretty confident that any amount of, any amount of barcoding uh, can uh, detect tench in, in a pretty meaningful way to help track this invasion front. So what about all this? really great extra bycatch data that uh, EDA metabarcoding provides. Uh, and so that's, I wanted to look at some of that in relation to our traditional sampling, um, just from a fish community and diversity perspective, um, because you get so much great presence absence data back when you use EDA metabarcoding. And so one of the questions um, we had was, uh, just a pretty standard one, how well does the EDA fish community data complement traditional fisheries efforts? Um, and so here I'll share a uh, divergent bar chart. Uh, these are fish that were, uh, well, captured and then detected depending on the method. Uh, so fish that occurred in both methods. On the left is common names, the bottom is percent occurrence. Uh, the blue bars this is the genetic method, you name it, you name it barcoding. And then the orange is traditional, um, mainly electrofishing. And, um, what we see here is that uh, metabarcoding is pretty darn good at uh, uh, detecting fish. 
um, and uh, to some degree representing what we're seeing for some of our abundant species that we catch traditionally. And I'll point out a few things um, as well. And so here, I just wanted to highlight some individual species um, that were uh, interesting. So red boxes along the common name are more demersal fish, green pelagic fish, and the arrows are kind of pointing it out in relation to our traditional sampling. And um, what we're seeing you know, makes sense. Um, you know, we're electrofishing in uh, near shore shallow vegetated areas. So we're uh, most likely not gonna be coming across a lot of round goby or walleye, freshwater drum, red horse, tube nose goby. Um, same thing with pelagic species, uh, you know, that kind of uh, gear is, in that area isn't really gonna be targeting those. However, the DNA seems to wind up in those areas um, uh, in a pretty, at a pretty even rate, which was, uh, which was really interesting. Uh, and it kind of shows you, um, it kind of almost gives you a way to look at your gear suite and be able to manipulate it uh, to a degree based on what you're seeing with the metabarcoding data. Um, looking down here at the bottom, so these are more, these are rare detections in the data set. And so what kind of stood out here was that things that are traditionally rare to detect are also rare to detect their DNA as well. And I think that has a lot of applications, uh, not just for fish community assemblage work, diversity work, but also TME related work. Uh, and so as you can see here, uh, you know, electrofishing wise, um, you know, tench is a rare fish and we're detecting it, still detecting it, although at rare levels, fantail darter, rosy face shiners, some of these species are more rare for us to catch traditionally in the areas that we were serving, uh, which, is, which is really interesting and quite promising with this kind of uh, genetic data. Also, it's, it can be enlightening. Um, so I think uh, Doug Carlson shared at the beginning of the session, small fish are hard to identify, and that, uh, that holds true. And so one thing uh, that the genetic data kind of suggested is that um, we may be misclassifying, misidentifying uh, a subset of Johnny darters as tessellated darters. Uh, the genetic data came back with a pretty low but even proportion of tessellated and Johnny darters. However, we will, in our, uh, the fish that we identified, we only have in our database tessellated darters, and so it would give us something to kind of when we go back up to the river to, to be more scrutinous of as well. So, so um, you know, it can inform you in, in multiple ways. Um, so one, so that was looking at species of where where uh, that was looking at where species occurred in both methods. Here, I just want to point out um, where species were unique to each method because that did occur. I think it's also worth mentioning that. You know, although I'm comparing these two gears, they didn't happen. They happened in the same time frame, but certainly not in the same places. In some scenarios, we were sampling, we were plucking DNA and doing traditional sampling in the same area. But in areas, we were also trying to just cover our, our range because we are there for an active invasion front and focus primarily on that. But essentially, 30% of the species by method were unique, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, and one of the, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why it could be some of the differences in sampling locations for example, we uh, electrofished an American brook lamprey in the lower St. Regis River, and we didn't collect any water samples down there just because we we're more focused on the unit uh, above um, the canal. We also really interestingly caught a vermiculated silphin catfish uh, below Lock and Dam, and we removed that fish most likely in a program release, so uh, hopefully no DNA is left in the system to, to be, uh, to be uh, seen. So there's also a lot of caveats. When it comes to DNA, that's something worth uh, mentioning. Uh, there's some cl classification issues, particularly with lepisostids. We had a couple of interesting singleton detections um, that could get your head spinning, but for the most part, um, the data was, was uh, pretty in line with what we expect to see. Uh, we also wanted to look at uh, just comparing the two methods from a diversity aspect. So this is just a species accumulation curve. Orange is a traditional method. Blue is uh, EDA and a barcoding. And what we see here is that, you know, getting richness per sample, or in this case, for traditional number of sites, it gets you to the same place with roughly the same amount of effort. Uh, to the right is observed species richness there. Um, maybe genetic, your EDNA metabarcoding might get you to the species a little bit quicker. But what stood out to me was when you combine the two, uh, you kind of get a little more robust picture of the community uh, with a total of 71 observed species when you combine the two methods. So I think there's a big advantage um, in using them both in a complementary fashion. So some of the key takeaways here, um, we were able to detect tench using metabarcoding, which is excellent. Uh, the detections in the canal were not excellent, um, so we'll follow up with that. 
Um, and we were able to add on some spatial surveillance at pretty low time cost. And then on the fish community side, metabarcoding is really, I'm really interested in it because it gives you all, not just a zero and one on what you're interested in, but it also gives you all this great community data that other folks might be interested in. And looking at it, um, you know, the traditional genetic methods detected many of the same species, although there was some uniqueness. Um, the genetic methods seem to be a little less, uh, they kind of span the, the fish gills a little better than traditional gear, and some of that might have to do with how EDNA moves. And that's a whole different aspect of it, but interesting nonetheless. And then lastly, you know, if you're trying to apply, apply this on a diversity or TNE side of things, you know, maybe pairing both methods in a meaningful way can give you a better depiction of fish diversity than uh, either method alone. So that is it. And with that, I'll take any questions. So that is a good question for our geneticists, which I am not. So I cannot answer that. I do know class, like taxonomic class, classification is an evolving issue with this. Uh, and again, that's another another slight caveat with metabarcoding is that you are reducing some of your specificity because you're using a reference library that's less specific. And so there's some trade-offs there. But when it comes to hybrids, I'm certainly not the person to ask. My very limited understanding is that when you would be able to discern, but you know, don't go by what I say. <laughs> okay. Gotta have one more question. Somebody. <laughs> business meeting. You're in charge. Should I hit on uh, record here? What do I do? Yeah, I think it's Who's still running recording. It? Yeah. She is. You can probably stop it. Remember the button is there on top, maybe? Yeah. You want to stop that, Lisa? <laughs> Somebody's fine.